Did you give the high school students classes like this too? Uh, yeah. That's cool. Over there in the... I wish they'd have done that when I went to high school. Like, yeah, Larry Goodson, wouldn't that? Yeah. Well, kind of sure this is, these, are, these stories came from stuff that we've actually done here that I went over around Motor Ridge already from the mouth and everything. And this one here, uh, this is an 86 Toyota Cressida, which is that funky car right there, one of the one of the maintenance men. It had a 2188 engine and 96,000 miles. It had a warm idle misfire, but it ran okay when it was cold. All right, so, due to the nature of this problem was that the car ran really smooth when the engine was cool, but it developed like a consistent idle misfire kind of operating temperature. So, we're talking about that. Huh? We're talking about that. Oh, we're talking about uh, doing some smoking. Oh, the smoking. Yeah, yeah not vaping, but smoking. All right, so. Um, no vaping. Now, as we look at it to start with, uh, we decided we were gonna have to. We got to track this down. And does it? Do you guys ever build a, a, a matrix in your mind about how you're gonna find a problem? Whenever you first walk out there, you don't know. You know what the symptom is, but you don't know what's going on. So you have to have a way of attacking this thing logically, or you'll never figure out what's wrong. Or you'll be standing there shrugging your shoulders, not having a clue what to do. Um, yesterday, I don't know if Katie was even aware of that. And when Charles uh, was taking that uh, that T30, one of them screws out, he just rounded it right on out, you know. That was smooth as hell, wasn't it? You know, so, I mean, and, and whenever you're taking that solenoid pack off and the thing's rounded off and it's up in a kind of a hole, oh, you got, that one, the pack? yeah, the one that was up in a hole and all that. I said, man, he, I guess he figured you probably had started the rounding off process and he just finished it up, so. But, uh, one, one, whatever happened though, we, we actually got some, uh, we drilled it, just drilled straight up in there until we got it past the shoulder and it, the head popped off and then we just, but I mean that was aggravating as I'll get out. Uh, and here's the other thing, when you're spinning the drill really fast, <coughs> the drill bit starts to get soft and the bolt starts to get hard. So basically, you know, we started out drilling with an air drill. Well, you can't really control the speed of an air drill with a flip. And uh, that silly uh, uh, Makita with the uh, with the keyless chuck, you know, is aggravating. Although, you know, one way or another, we finally got a, a slow drill with the Makita and, worked it up in there and I had to resharpen the drill bit on the grinder and all that kind of thing. And, uh, anyway, um, but one of the, that's a, what that was, what I, where I went up with that, you know, is uh, I didn't know exactly where I was going, but I know I like making, but uh, one way or another, um, what we had was critical thinking. How are you going to solve this problem? Charles tried to ruin it, basically, and we had to go back in there. And the, and the, the bolt? Yeah, the bolts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how fast is it pouring out? I know it's dripping out. Well, if you push it up in there until it's running out, you let it run out until it's dripping. And then you know that you've got enough in there. I'm going to put some more in there. Yeah, put some more in there and let it be running out. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, so when a vehicle idles rough with high fuel trim numbers but normalizes at road speed, we're talking about a wagon leak. What do high fuel trim numbers mean? Nick, what do high fuel trim numbers mean? If you're seeing plus 20 on your fuel trim, what do you know? And I'm talking about long fuel trim. Your short fuel trim typically going to be bouncing around zero, even if long fuel trim is high, if you got a problem. So you got high fuel trim. What does that mean? Somebody tell me what that means. High fuel trim. You got that? What about you? You got any idea? High fuel trim? High fuel trim means that it is correcting for a lean condition. That means that the oxygen sensor has started diving lean and it's saying, I don't like this. I'm going to have to put some more fuel in there. And so it uses the, uh, the little fine adjustment, which is your short fuel trim, to start putting it in there. And then it turns that knob and turns that knob and it turns that knob and it gets it up here around 20%. And the oxygen sensor comes back alive, which means it's actually canceled out whatever the lean problem was. Negative fuel trim is going to be what it does whenever it's having to subtract fuel because of a saturated canister or too much. If somebody has gone too long without changing the motor oil and there's gasoline in the motor oil and all that. Um, one time my dad uh, called about my mother's car. You know, my dad had shop for years and years and years. After he retired, uh, he said, Mom, he said, uh, he said, your mama's Chrysler has is, uh, is, uh, got a power loss light or whatever. It's a 91 Chrysler. I, don't remember. I said, well, turn the key on three times. It'll flash the codes. He said, I ain't fooling with all that mess. You know, yeah, older people were that like that sometimes. So I went over and I turned it on. I got a code 17. It means that it's running too cold. Running too cold. I said, you're going to put a thermostat in there. So he puts a thermostat in there. And uh, then he said, well, I think I'll go ahead and uh, a couple of weeks later, I thought I'm going to change the oil. So he changed the oil. After he changed the oil, it wouldn't idle. Why? 
He calls me. He's frustrated. All I did was change the oil, and it, now it won't idle. So I had to figure it out, right? Okay, so it's running too cold. So if it's running too cold, it's running rich. So if it's running rich, it's got the blow-by has actually contaminated the oil with gasoline. So it has fuel trimmed to the point to where it's counting on getting that gas fumes out of the PCV system. He drains the oil, puts it back in there, there's no gas in the oil. Now the fuel trims are so far out, it's like a carburetor's out of adjustment. So I said, pull your, pull your battery cables off for about 10 minutes, put them back on. So he did that, which went smooth as silk. I figured that one out on the phone. But think about that. If you've got one that's running rich, one of the things that Ford used to have us do was they'd have us take the uh, PCV valve out and, you know, stop up the uh, PCV valve, you know, where you're not going to vacuum leak there, and see if your fuel trim's normalized. You got it? Got the right one. Uh, uh, no, that's global multi-vehicle. You're going to have to have some work on it. You got any work on it in there? I'm working on it. work on it five. All right. You know, all right. So anyway, the long and the short of it was, uh, you see the little. Um, what, what I was what I was getting at with that thing is, if you stop up the PCV valve and, you, and it normalizes, you know that you need to change your oil before you do anything else. Sometimes the simple oil change take care of power stroke diesels are that way too. If the oil if the uh, oil gets too contaminated, it'll cause trouble. See that split hose? When you see a hose like that, it's split. It's leaking. You know, look for stuff like that on your evaporative system. Anything is broke like that. We got a vacuum leak. Whenever we've got fuel trim numbers that are high, idling but normalizing at road speed, there's enough coming in there to where it overrides that. All right. So since 1986 predated OBD2 system by almost a decade, there was no misfire monitor code. Wouldn't be much of a help on this one. There are only 15 codes available on an 86 Cressida, but on a 2011 Ford Ranger, there's over 600 possible trouble codes. And it gets more of them every year and all that. So, uh, then what you're supposed to do is jump for that little thing and watch it flash and count all of that and everything like that, you know. I mean, that's really not too great. You know, the old-fashioned power balance test is a good way to determine which cylinder is misfiring if PCM stored PO3XX codes aren't available or if they're not helping. So if you've got, you know, that's PO3 whatever, it's going to tell you what cylinder, PO301, PO302, 345, whatever one it is. Now PO300 is a random uh, misfire you know, just on all cylinders. So one of the things you've got to determine is, is this something that's happening all the time? Like, is it random? And we're talking a misfire that come when it was warm. Whenever it, does it go poop, 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 or does it go boom, 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 boom? If it does boom, 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 then that means that you got usually a spark plug that's partially fouled or it's got too close. You ever heard one do that? You ever been standing at the exhaust and heard it go boom, 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 boom? You know, think about it. So, first thing I'm going to do, we got all the spark plugs. Just about anybody that does a lot of work like this, typically for years and years and years, first thing I'm going to do is jerk the plug out, look out. Now, a lot of times you'll have cop calls and stuff going on. Why do we have cop calls? Why are cop calls better? Who was listening yesterday? <laughs> what about cop call? We got a call per cylinder. What's better about that? Because we can control the timing on just that one cylinder, right? Yeah. Can't do that if you got call packs or anything else. All right. While well, a more seasoned technician pulled the spark plug wire for years at the risk of experiencing a bolt jolt and ignition module damage, it takes more sense. Makes more sense to disconnect the injectors or the cop call primary leads one at a time to find the dead cylinder. Always clear your codes when you're done so you don't wind up with a customer come back and say, hey, what well, check engine lights on? All right, so right here, if you pull that off, the reason I have that X'd out is because that high voltage likes to find somewhere else to go. Even if it doesn't shock you, it might go screaming back into some electronics somewhere like your module or whatever, and it may fry that. So be careful about that. Now, what I like to do, if I can get to the spark plug wires, if I've got to do it with the plug wires, I can't do it with the injectors, and I like to get a test light, to the ground, and I'll give me some little uh, dielectric grease, and I'll try to back probe those without tearing anything up. And if you get it out far enough down in there where you're touching that little metal thing, you kill the cylinder without endangering anything. The worst part about it, you don't want to poke a hole in the wire, you know. I had one ding dong that I used to work with, and he would just poke a hole in the wire. And then what would happen then is somebody's reaching down there close to that while it's running, it would reach out and touch someone. Bap! You know, we were down there working at Sabine. We had these little uh, Dodge uh, vehicles that we were working on. And it, this, this guy that was one of the, the uh, bosses out there, or the guys that were doing the mud pumping, uh, the, this, I, I had shown these boys that were working with me how to check for a spark. And one went started, it was a Ferrari. 
I've never seen this before or since, but he says, uh, I want to check this for spark, Joe, spin it over. Somehow or another, whenever he held it over there checking for something to spark, it went back through the steering column and Joe was in there going, did, 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 him up through the key. <laughs> I've never seen that happen before. That's a little scary. Anyway, I got to take a look at what I'm about that. All right, the long and short of it was the engine warmed up. We found the number one cylinder was dead on arrival, so we connected the O-scope, produced no conclusive results. The pattern on that cylinder was practically the same as all the others. Right? All right, so you guys get, need to get, or you can uh, interpret a scope pattern on a secondary. If I'm in a secondary size of a scope pattern, look almost just the like, but the voltages are different, so we'll talk about that in another presentation. All right, a quick look at the spark plug reveal. Nothing particularly interesting other than the fact that it was showing some wear and the center electrode resistance on that plug was higher than the others by about 2,000 ohms. I like to measure between here and the tip of the plug. And I've talked about this before, but whenever I wrote about that in one of my Motor Age articles, the champion spark plug guy sent me a scathing email saying it was a stupid way to check spark plug. You're supposed to do it with a scope, blah, 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 and all that. And then I said, well, I don't know why a champion's got a problem with it, but Ford actually tells us to do that, and it's not supposed to have more than 8,000 ohms. That was in the training. They actually had a picture of it on the screen where you look at that, you know, checking the center electrode resistance. A lot of people don't do it, but I like to do it. Didn't cost much in time or cash to throw a set of spark plugs at it, but to no avail. Nothing happened there. Okay, listening to the injector with a stethoscope gave no indication the injector was doing anything wrong, but we could do an injector flow test later if we need be. Who's done an injector flow test in here? If you haven't done one, you need to do one. All right. You, do an injector flow test this afternoon on the green GMC and tell me the last misfire. All right. So... That's Lamont, that's the guy that we're working with, by the way. And, uh, all right, and it's giving me a hard time. All right. And the engine should sound like it had normal compression on all six cylinders. You remember what I told you about it when you spin one over? If, you're, if you got one that's misfired and you're spinning it over, you go, hey, 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 like one of the cylinders ain't squeezing air. Or if it's going click, 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 that might mean it's locked up, right? And, uh, I asked Katie when she was telling me about click, click, click on the starter stuff. I says, can you turn the engine with a breaker bar? Is it locked up? Yes. <laughs> Not anymore. And now you're real strong because you turned the locked up engine with a breaker bar. All right. The interest of gathering data, we got a compression gauge and measured one, two, and three to see how they were puffing, and all three were pushing about 170 PSI. Nothing wrong with that, right? We're basically seeing the same kind of compression on the ones that are... Uh, hitting it, we're on the one that's missing, so we can forget about compression for right now. What are we doing here? We're trying to find out what is not, right? We eliminate things. We keep going. We keep going until we eliminate everything. This was a this was a misfire. All right. So a running compression test on the same three cylinders would be about 75 psi on cylinder one, 90 on the two behind it. That's interesting. But that in and of itself wasn't very convincing that there was a problem with it deep in the engine, right? We haven't exhausted all possible non-intrusive tests and non-intrusive tests are where you don't have to rip a bunch of stuff out of there, you know? Yeah, and when I'm calling the shots, we'll pull no rocker arm cover before it's time. Now, sometimes we have to pull a rocker arm cover. Remember what Charles found wrong with the white Jeep? The white Jeep Commander, remember that? If you read the Motor Age article, that just came out in this month's Motor Age. It's got a picture of the white commander, and I actually mentioned Charles in there. I didn't put his last name, but I mentioned Charles. And you remember what it was? You remember what was going on with the, with the white commander? You know, what was Charles, come here. Hurry up. Charles, come here. Hurry up. When Charles comes here, I'm going to have you tell me what he found with the white commander. You remember anything about the white commander? All right, the white commander. Remember about the white commander? Charles, come here and tell me about the white commander. Come here. Come here. Tell me about the white commander. Stand right here. Tell me about the white commander. You worked on the white commander. Why are you out there with the safety glasses on? Sorry, dog. White commander, the one that you worked on over there, the big one with the other big fat ugly tires, and when you turned it, it would grind whenever you tried to turn. And it was missing on oh. number eight. What'd you uh, find? I checked the coal and the spark plug and everything like that, and then all of them looked good. I even moved the coals around. And you heard something you didn't And there was, there was clattering in the valve cover, so I told, pulled the valve cover off. And the How lifter. hard was it to pull the valve cover off? It wasn't that hard at all. I just right. pulled it right but you off. did have to suck the juice out of it, didn't you? The AC juice. Remember that? I did have to suck, suck the AC juice off and pull the AC line off yeah. the compressor. And uh, What did you find? The uh, rocker roller was... Roller off. rocker was out of place just laying down in there. <laughs> so if the roller rocker is out of place, it's not opening. Which valve was it not opening? Uh, number eight. 
Number eight what? Exhaust intake. Uh, I think it was exhaust. Exhaust. And so he put that back on and that thing was sailing along. But then we had a coolant leak because of that stupid little T that was egg shaped and all that junk. We, had a, we worked on it. Anyway, we got that one straightened out. He thought it was a blown head gasket. How many times have you heard people say blown head gasket when well, they ain't even checked nothing? Yeah. You know what I mean? Blown head gasket. Blown head gasket. Fuck their pictures. All right. So. All right, my guy was running out of ideas, but I had to scrape the bottom of the barrel. He had a handy can of carburetor spray and told him to safely, carefully, and sparingly mist the non flash point prone areas of the engine. Don't spray the hot exhaust. You want those to catch fire to see if the sound of the engine changed, and it did. So this B12 carburetor spray, and we sprayed it in there, and all of a sudden, boom. And so, what does that tell us? We're spraying yeah, carburetor. We got a vacuum leak. All right, so here we go. All right, this is Jimmy, by the way. Say hello to Jimmy. That's Jimmy right there. You got nothing to do with this story, but that's Jimmy. All right, the spray of the cleaner down under the intake manifold, the driver's side front of the engine found that the skip evaporated, the engine ran smooth. We were looking at fuel trim readings, which we had no way to read on this old car. It had no data stream. We would have seen the short numbers dropping back towards zero when we got up above an idle, and also when we sprayed our cover spray. I always like to take the car. There's one of these worksheets I give you guys. I'm at the throttle body. Look at your oxygen sensor and all that. If you've got some kind of a leak, like you get your fuel trim numbers on the screen, your short fuel trim, your long fuel trim, and if you're find, trying to find out what's going on with that, and you take and just spray a little touch of carburetor spray here, there, and yonder, if you see it react and you hear the engine run better, you know you're closing in on your leak. Right? Now, sometimes you'll have one that's got a pretty serious leak where the, uh, well, on yours, you were talking about the upper intake. It's got that paper gasket in there. It likes to slip out of the way and leak and tear up. And you know, if you're if it's idling fast because of that, you can actually cap over, put your hand over the throttle uh, body. And if it keeps running when you put your hand over the throttle body, instead of trying to suck your hand in there, you know it's getting air from somewhere else. That's what the deal is on that. Okay. Okay. So now then we definitely had some unmetered air making its way into the intake. <laughs> well, I didn't reveal it at the time. So it learned better by discovery than by words. I knew there had to be an intake leak right at the point where the injector delivered its fuel. And there were two possibilities. This was right here on that engine right there where it was. All right. Now, one would be the injector O-ring, but that wasn't in the area where the spray made the change. The other would be an intake gasket problem at the number one runner. And I told him to raise it for a closer inspection of the underside of the intake. And whatever works, I guess, if you put enough smoke in a closed chamber, it makes a breach leak easier to spot. So some of us would, some of these guys would smoke a cigar, and they shove it in there with a hoop, and you blow it in there with, like that back in the yeah, beach. This is not with the engine running, this is when the engine turned it off, right? And at the time was, some of us looked for exhaust leaks by pouring a little bit of transmission fluid in the carburetor. And then you see the smoke coming out where, the, where it was. That makes sense, doesn't it? That was back in the day. Uh, all right, look at this. Look what we have here. Crowded under there, a lot of stuff in the way, but what appeared the intake gasket was split. See right there? That's where the smoke came spurting out. See the smoke? All right. The, the smoke machine is one of the best ways to find an intake leak because it'll take you right to where it is. And it'll make work it's in. Now, don't get confused whenever you've got emissions, you use the smoke to find a vapor leak in your emission system. When you're using it on the intake, you're going to cap off the throttle body with one of them cups, you know, on a little a uh, little plug cap things like we got with the smoke machine. And uh, we had a vacuum test smoke machine out there. That smoke juice costs $90 a pint, by the way, so use it sparingly. You can get 500 smoke tests out of one tank, though. Smoke's the best way to find it. Or you can not submerge the whole system in a half a drum of water like you did the tire the other day. It's like we're magicians. We had only small mirrors in our toolboxes. Now we have smoke and mirrors. Yay! Smoke and mirrors is good as our friend. All right, smoke can be used to check for vacuum leaks, EGR leaks in the panel shaft, leaks under the dash, throttle body leaks, brake booster leaks, intercooler system leaks, uh, each, each, you know, HVAC uh, air, air management control. Like if you've got a vacuum leak somewhere in your HVAC system, you can pump smoke through there and see where that's leaking too. Like if you've got a busted diaphragm on one of your little actuators. Injector oil leaks, wind, water leaks, oil leaks, basically axle and pinion seal leaks, air injection leaks, Map sensor leaks and a whole lot more. Right. Having a smoke machine opens up a whole new world of closed cavity diagnostics, and the smoke is non toxic. Not quite as much fun as vaping, I don't suppose, but it smells like lemons, right? Okay, checking an intake leak. There's our leak right there. See that little busted gasket? All right, checking an intake leak with the smoke machine is really simple. All right, so that's basically what we did there. We found it leaking in the number one runner. It needed a gasket. Look at this. Speaking of leaks, 
What kind of leak is this? That is a water leak because somebody disturbed that grommet and got it out of place, water running down the harness, got in the car, and whenever it came a rain, you'd have water standing that deep in the driver's side floor more of the car. On that. And uh, we actually, here's something else I'm going to tell you really quick. Every now and then you're going to have to put something like a hood cable in a car. So pay attention to that grommet that's going through the firewall and make sure you get it popped in there like it's supposed to. Because if you just shove that thing in there, boom, yeah, the hood opens good, yay. Well, first time it rains, he's going to come back with that much water in the floorboard. Because that water likes to run down through there and get on that cable and it goes inside the car. And it really ticks the customer off whenever you did the work on the car. They didn't have water leak before and now they do. You know, always get the benefit of the doubt. Okay. Technician A says an average leak is smaller than 10,000 of an inch is acceptable according to current federal emission standards. Technician B says the evaporative system is in place to reduce NOx emissions. Who is correct? You got 10 seconds. You digging for your pencil? Yeah. Well, that's uh fairly odd. Yeah, it is. That's the kind of pen you need, though. Mm -hmm. One that's made out of a piece of brake glass. Technician A says a perceived lean condition must always be the result of a stoichiometric combustion mixture imbalance with too much air and not enough fuel. Technician B says a perceived lean condition can indirectly cause an engine to run rich. You got a new hat. Charles said he fixed a machine that had been broke down for how long? A couple months. A couple of months, been sitting out there, found that one no uh, wire going to the button. I mean, I mean, no power going to the button, he powered up the button, everything started. They thought he was Superman, didn't they? They give you a cape. Technician A says pulling the spark plug wires one at a time to find a weak cylinder can damage the ignition module on some systems. Technician B says it makes more sense to kill the cylinders one at a time by unplugging the injector one at a time, if possible. Who do you think about that? You got seven seconds. Six, five, four, three, two, one. <coughs> the idle air control system on the ATC, the F5 vehicle, controls the idle speed. Now, this is electronic automatic throttle control. Like the, got a motor, you know, like this. This right here is the ATC. That's got a motor that drives the throttle plate. This is non. How does it do it? Does it move the throttle plate? Does it operate an actuator that allows metered air to bypass the throttle plate? Does it advance the retarded ignition timing or none of the above? Oh, screw. Bonus question. What is this? I know. <laughs> a piece of metal. Yeah. It's actually a heat shield. It keeps from cooking the oil pressure sitting in it on Jennifer's part. All right. Technician A says an unmetered air leak, like a cracked in air inlet hose, will drive a mass airflow fuel system rich because the mass airflow isn't measuring all the incoming air. Technician B says the O2 sensor input can be lean and cause the PCM to drive the entire system rich if one cylinder is misfiring. <laughs> Kayla, are you turning into a skeleton? How long is it going to take you to get that head off? Uh, Forever. Technician A says CO emissions come from two rich air fuel mixtures. Technician B says HC commissions, uh, excuse me, commission, emissions come from two rich air fuel mixtures. Who is correct? A says leaving the oil filter cap loose can cause fuel trim readings to go negative. B says using the wrong PCV valve can cause the fuel trim readings to go positive. You guys need to burn this thing in about fuel trim. Fuel trim is important. You're going to need to know this, okay? Don't doze off. <laughs> oh. Oh. We, don't, we don't allow ADD in here, okay? You throw it at it. Technician A says OBD1 system on some vehicles uses the O2 sensor to feed back the input to determine whether an EGR is flowing. B says EGR flow doesn't affect O2 output on OBD2 vehicles. 
Who's correct about that? Go for it, Sierra. You know the answer to that one. Technician A says CO emissions come from two rich air fuel mixtures. Wait a minute, is that the same one I just put on there earlier? Yeah. That's a bonus question. You get to answer it twice. I can't believe that's that. That's goofy. A says older evaporative emission systems purges the canister only apart from older and rich running idle concerns. Technician B says some OBD2 evaporative emission systems actually purge the canister while the engine is idling. We've got four minutes. To go back to these right there. All right. All right. The current official federal emission standards, the ones that I know about, are concerned with a 20 thousandth leak. Now, there may be a smaller standard right now that I don't know about, but 20 thousandths is the last one I knew about. All right. What's, uh, why, is the, why is the evaporative system in place? What, are we, what emission are we reducing with that, Mr. Emissions Lady? Huh? What? Hydrocarbons, which is what you smell at the gas pump. That's what we're trying to get rid of with the evaporative emission system, okay? Not NOx. NOx is what we use EGR for. So what are we there? Hey. Oh, y'all didn't figure that out? All right, B is not right. A is not right, so that's going to be neither of those guys. Because, I mean, based on what I know about the evaporative system, like I said, I could be missing something. I mean, if there be, could be something coming out that I didn't know about. Uh, perceived <coughs> heat condition must always be the result of a stoichiometric combustion mixture balance with too much air and not enough fuel. It always is a, is, a, is, a, is a red flag when you're taking a test because other things can cause this, right? Too much air and not enough fuel. If the air is not being measured right by the Maris Airflow Center, like we was telling a lie, you could actually have the right amount of air and fuel, but it wouldn't be reported right and you call it away. So this guy right here is wrong. B says perceived lean condition can indirectly cause the engine to run. It can because it will actually increase fuel trim. If you try to correct for a lean condition, it can make it run rich. So B is correct. A says pulling the spark plug wires one at a time can damage the ignition bundle. It can. He's right. B says it makes some more, more sense to kill the sellers. He's right too. So I'm going to say both those guys are right. All right, air control system on. Uh, it, move, it actually operates an actuator to allow metered air to bypass the throttle plate. Back in the day, they used to have a little uh, motorized actuator that would move the throttle plate, but that's that's uh, TFI stuff and all that. You know, I mean, throttle body injects. All right. What was the answer? Uh, oh, did B. I miss you up on that? All right, that's going to be B. A says an unmetered air leak like a cracked air hose will drive a mass airflow system rich because the mass airflow isn't measuring all the incoming air. Actually, if it's not measuring all the incoming air, it's not going to put as much fuel in there, is it? So it's going to make it run lean. lean. Right? Let's screw that up that way. Technician B says the O2 sensor input can read lean and cause the PCM to drive the entire system rich if one cylinder is misfiring. He's correct. Technician A says CO emissions come from two rich air fuel mixtures. It does. What do you got in there? You got oxygen that's wanting to get married to the hydrocarbons, right? If there's too many hydrocarbons, so you got CO2, is what you're actually shooting for. If you don't have, if you got too much fuel, not enough air, you'll have CO or HC. Right? CO is a little bit too rich, HC is a lot too rich. Which means the CO means you've only got one molecule, I wanted two, HC means you didn't get none. Okay? And so there you go. Both of those. Almost there, y'all. Technician A says leaving the oil filler cap loose can cause fuel turbulence to feel negative. No! It'll cause them, which way will it go? Will it go negative or positive? Positive. They'll go positive. Why? Because the PCV system is pulling air, unmetered air, through the oil filler cap. I've actually seen one with an oil filler cap that had a missing gasket. It's made it run bad. All you have to do is put an oil filler cap on and fix it. Uh, the wrong PCV valve can cause it if you put one in there that's pulling too much air. Seen that before too. PCV valve is actually a metered uh, thing that needs to be the right size. You can't just slam a PCV valve on a BIA. You got that? Huh? Yep. Yeah. All right. Then O2 sensor feedback to determine whether the EGR is flowing. Some of them did. General Motors used to like to do that, as I remember. Uh, they would look at the EGR and watch it. To, it was a feedback to see if EGR is flowing. EGR flow doesn't affect O2 output on OB2 vehicles. Well, actually, it's going to affect it, but it's, it's figured in by the algorithms in the engine controller. 
both? Or 